My name is Martin Smith. I'm director of the Superfund Research Program and professor of toxicology here at Berkeley. I'm going to be talking to you about our work on finding the causes of leukemia. I first got interested in this uh, whole uh, uh, subject because two of my favorite uncles died of leukemia while I was still at college and became generally interested in the causes of cancer and finding out how to prevent it. Now leukemia is cancer of the blood. It's uh, cancer of the blood forming system and every day you make uh, millions if not billions of cells from what are called pluripotent stem cells in the bone marrow of your body. And they form into uh, undifferentiated cells called, called blasts, which are shown here in the middle, and eventually become fully differentiated cells, which circulate in your blood and defend you from infection, uh, clot your blood if you uh, cut yourself, uh, carry oxygen around the blood, and uh, defend you from things like viruses. In the f so granulocytes defend you from bacteria and other things, and lymphocytes protect you from mainly from viruses. So if you don't form fully functional uh, immune cells like this in the blood, then you become like, susceptible to infections, things like pneumonia. You become tired because uh, you can't carry oxygen in the blood, you become anemic. And you can't clot your blood, so you become, uh, you start to bruise and bleed internally. And so the typical signs, early signs of leukemia are that you uh, get common infections, that you get tired, and that you uh, show bruises on your body. Now in what happens in leukemia is that the differentiation or the maturation of these cells called white blood cells is blocked at that early blast stage when they're immature. And so you end up in the bone marrow with a large number of immature blast cells which are really no good to you because they're not functional. They don't defend you from infection and other things, uh, but they uh, uh, pack your bone marrow with, with useless cells. And the diagram here shows it for one type of leukemia, which is called acute myeloid leukemia, which is one of the most common forms of leukemia in adults. And you can see that what happens is it gets blocked in the myeloblast stage. You end up with a lot of immature cells, these eventually pass into the blood, and the way that you detect leukemia is by seeing these, uh, these cells in the blood. Now blood in leukemia is literally pale blood, and that's what the word leukemia means. And if you look at it under a microscope, you see a lot of these immature blast cells shown on the left, and normal blood looks like the, the tube with the dark red on the right, but the leukemic blood has a lot less red cells, which means you're anemic, and it's packed with these useless white cells. So uh, in the United States in the coming year, there'll be around 13,000 uh, new cases of AML. Uh, this is uh, a, a fairly rare cancer compared to something like, say, lung cancer, which has around more than 200,000 new cases every year, but it's still a significant um, uh, cause of illness and uh, unfortunately it's largely untreatable um, and you only have about a 20% chance of surviving over five years. Now the uh, incidence of AML increases dramatically among people over the age of 60 but it's also seen in children. But typically uh, the, the type of leukemia seen in children is somewhat different. It's um, called ALL or lymphocytic leukemia. Now, uh, what do we know about the causes of acute myeloid leukemia, or AML? Well, we know that um, in the, in the uh, survivors in the Japanese atomic bomb detonations, there was a, a, a vastly increased risk of AML. So we know that high doses of radiation cause it. We also know that, unfortunately, the treatment of various cancers, such as breast and ovarian cancer and non-Hodgkin lymphoma by chemotherapy, often produces uh, secondary cancers, secondary leukemias in the patients. Therapeutic radiation, such as diagnostic x-rays, uh, are also known to cause leukemia. As far as chemicals are concerned, we know that exposure to benzene, usually in the occupational setting of the workplace, and formaldehyde, more recently, have been uh, described as causing leukemia in people. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, for example, now concludes that both benzene and formaldehyde uh, occupational exposure causes leukemia. 
some of our work on formaldehyde was highly significant in, uh, in, in making this, uh, establishing this link. Uh, the other known cause of leukemia are tobacco smoking, um, which is uh, relatively modest. It produces about a 1.5-fold uh, increased risk, but the Surgeon General has concluded that tobacco smoking is a cause of AML. Other causes are family history, uh, which may be due to genetics, but may also be due to common exposures within a family. There are also multiple studies linking pesticides with AML, uh, but it's not sure which pesticides are, uh, are involved, and so this uh, is an area for future research. There is a very similar um, condition known as myelodysplastic syndromes, which is also a cancer which has been rising in recent years in elderly people and is often a precursor to full-blown AML. And studies of this uh, type of cancer have shown that very similar associations with, with uh, risk factors, such as family history, about a two-fold increase of MDS, cigarette smoking, ever versus never, producing an elevated risk. Wine drinking in this particular study was shown to be protective, although the relationships with alcohol are a little unclear. Again, high agricultural chemical exposure was linked to MDS, as was exposure to benzene, solvents, and gasoline, with about a doubling of the risk. So these are the, well, the established causes uh, of leukemia, and we have worked under the Superfund program for quite some time about benzene. And we've been working on benzene now for many, many years, trying to understand how it causes leukemia. And it's, all I can tell you is from this slide, you can see it's complicated. It's not a simple process. The uh, benzene must be metabolized, and then the metabolites target what are called the pluripotent stem cells or hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. They cause genetic changes and epigenetic changes in these stem cells which leads to this block of differentiation and uh, the production of what are called leukemic stem cells, which eventually give rise to the cancer that we've talked about earlier. The interesting thing about benzene is that uh, our work under the Superfund program has also shown that more metabolites are formed at low part per billion sort of environmental exposures to benzene than at high levels in the workplace in the part per million range. And this fits with what's known about the dose response curve for leukemia. And this is a slide from a, a large study of Australian workers in the petroleum industry, where you can see that there is an elevation of leukemia at a relatively low levels, which then tends to plateau out and flatten with, uh, as the exposure level increases which fits with the work that Professor Rappaport uh, and I have done with Lu Ping Zhang and others in, in our group, which shows that uh, the metabolism of benzene occurs at a much greater extent at low levels than at high levels. Working with uh, investigators at the National Cancer Institute and colleagues at the China CDC, uh, we studied workers exposed to benzene in China in a shoe factory near Tianjin, and published a paper in Science in 2004, which showed that levels below the US occupational standard uh, of one part per million produced bone marrow and blood toxicity in these workers uh, um, at these relatively lower levels than had previously been seen. We followed up this work by using uh, the sophisticated tools of toxicogenomics, uh, which Professor Vulpe and others will talk about. But, um, uh, we have recently described a signature for benzene exposure in which 16 genes were altered uh, at, at increasing doses of benzene, uh, which seems to reflect an effect of benzene uh, way below what has previously been observed. This was of interest to uh, colleagues in the Environmental Protection Agency who are interested in risk assessment from benzene. And so what we have done we is we have examined the uh, pathways that are altered in uh, this benzene exposed population using these microarray technologies. And perhaps one of the most interesting findings is that of the disease pathways that are altered, the acute myeloid leukemia pathway was the one that was most significantly altered 
uh, of all the disease pathways, which tends to fit with uh, what we know about the, the uh, cancer-causing ability of benzene. And so Reuben Thomas, who's part of the Superfund Core D, along with Alan Hubbard, have specifically modeled this, uh, this, these genes in this AML pathway and looked at the benzene dose response for them. And if you focus on the, on the slide on the left here, or the graph on the left, you can see that what happens is that even in exposures below 1.1 part per million, the expression of genes in the AML pathway is altered by benzene exposure, which increases over time uh, as dose increases and tends to plateau out, very similar to what we see for the cancer curve. And so this uh, is of interest to uh, colleagues at the EPA, interested in next generation risk assessment, which will use this type of data to better predict risks at low doses for things like benzene and other compounds. So I've talked about what we know about the causes of leukemia, and even though benzene is a known cause, it probably only causes at most about 1% of the leukemias in the United States. Ionizing radiation, um, probably a couple of percent. Cancer chemotherapy, there have been estimates that this is as high as 10% or more, but probably typically it's very 4 or 5%. Smoking is a little hard to estimate, but um, let's say it's not that great a risk factor for leukemia, so around 10% of the leukemias in the United States are that. The EPA has recently estimated that formaldehyde may contribute as much as 20% of the leukemias in the United States. But let's say, uh, just to be conservative, it's around one, as I believe the estimate by the EPA uh, may be uh, too high. And what happens is that you get that the total that we can explain for known causes of leukemia is around 18 or 20%. This leaves around 80% of the leukemias, which are called de novo leukemias, arising in the general population, and MDS, total number of cases, say 20 odd thousand, that remain unexplained. So we come to the, to the issue of, in research, is how are we gonna find the causes of these de novo leukemias, this 80%? Well, there are other probable causes. Obesity has recently been linked with increased risk of AML and I previously mentioned pesticides, and so that probably explains another 10% or so of the risk. Uh, this still leaves 70% of the leukemia cases in the United States unexplained. Recently, we had uh, a meeting at the National Cancer Institute and sat around and thought, well, what could explain this other 70%? But we couldn't really come up with any good hypotheses, and we have concluded that what we really need is an agnostic approach, some sort of approach where we look at all of the exposures and see what, um, what's really going on and see if we can get any clues to, to generate some good hypotheses. So the approach we're taking is to use what's called the exposome, which was first proposed by Chris Wilde, who's now the head of the International Agency for Research on Cancer in the ON, and he proposed this concept of the exposome which would represent all environmental exposures, including those from diet, lifestyle, and endogenous sources throughout your life. This was a very interesting concept, but the question became, how do you actually measure it? So this was Professor Weil's first paper on it, and Stephen Rappaport and I became extremely interested in this idea of how to measure the exposome. And Steve organized a workshop at the National Academy of Sciences uh, on this particular topic, which was very well attended and was game-changing. And this led us to write a, an article in Science about measuring the exposome in order to understand the links between environment and disease. Subsequently, there have been other papers on this exposome concept, and a second National Academy meeting recently occurred uh, in December and a write-up of that is being generated on measuring or characterizing individual exposomes. So what the exposome to Stephen Rappaport and I is about is measuring the internal chemical environment of people. Now whatever the changes are in your body that cause cancer, these should be measurable because it has to be chemically related in your blood. It doesn't matter whether it's radiation, noise, stress, or 
other infections or anything else. These must produce chemical changes in your blood, which then lead to changes in the, can in the, in the stem cells in the bone marrow, which must then in turn lead to leukemia. So everything has to have a chemical basis. And so if we could really measure this, this would really be a game changer. And in the Superfund program now here at Berkeley, we're working with uh, members of the chemistry department here at Berkeley to try and measure this internal exposome uh, using modern mass spectrometry. We're also using modern methods known as omics to try and characterize this whole process. So we believe that we can measure this exposome through omic signatures and measuring specific chemicals in the blood. There's various chemical specific assays we can use. We can measure reactive electrophiles through a process known as adductomics, which I don't have time to explain to you today, and also measure metals through metalomics, persistent organic compounds, and various metabolites in the blood through a process known as metabolomics. The idea is to measure all of the known chemicals in the bloodstream. There's various other bioassays we use as well to try and look at gene expression or epigenetic changes. The idea is to try and amass as much information as possible about environmental exposures through life in order to generate hypotheses on what the causes of leukemia really are. And this is what we're working on today. And finally, I want to thank all our collaborators in this work, especially those at the China CDC in Beijing, Guilan Li and Son Yan Yin, uh, our colleagues at the NCI in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, Nat Rothman, Ching Lan, Min Shen, and many others there. Uh, my colleagues here at UC Berkeley, especially Steve Rappaport, Lu Ping Zhang, and Chris Scabola. In our group, the lab work was done largely by Cleona McHale and Zi Ying Ji and the, our statistician colleagues Reuben Thomas and Alan Hubbard from co our biostatistics corps. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Rilva Mullen from the University of Utrecht in Holland, who has been instrumental in uh, studying the exposure assessment in the benzene exposed workers and the formaldehyde exposed workers. And finally, I want to thank uh, the agencies which fund us, the National Cancer Institute, and especially the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in North Carolina which through the Superfund Research Program and other grants has funded the work that I've described to you today. Thank you very much.